Hello, St. Louis. This is your host, Brian Bisking, and this is the STL Leaders Podcast. Did you know that there are 2.8 million people that live in the St. Louis metro area? There are many business leaders inside of that population. I started this podcast to give those leaders a voice. I was raised by one of those leaders. My father is a small business owner in Edwardsville, Illinois, and I grew up watching him run his business and meeting many small business owners just like him. I knew as a kid that the impact that these leaders have in our community is instrumental. I have developed a great passion for learning from these leaders. The STL Leaders podcast mission is to speak to these leaders and gain some insight into their vision for success and how they view leadership. Each episode is a view into their mindset, theory, and strategy of successful leadership. This podcast is brought to you by Synchrony HR, NWO IT Services, and Inbound Blend Digital Marketing. Hello, St. Louis. This is Brian Bisking of STL Leaders. And today on this episode, we have Adrian Bracey. Adrian has served since 2009 as the Chief Executive Officer for YWCA Metro St. Louis. Bracey transitioned to the nonprofit sector after 18 years in senior financial management with the National Football League to serve a calling to inspire and make a difference in the lives of women and girls. Prior to YWCA, Bracey was Chief Financial Officer for the Arizona Cardinals. Her time in Phoenix followed more than 10 years with the St. Louis Rams. Bracey began her NFL career with the Miami Dolphins in her hometown of Miami, Florida. Bracey has received numerous awards throughout her career, including Black Enterprise 50 Most Powerful Blacks in Sports Award, St. Louis Business Journal Most Influential Business Women Award, and the Small Business Monthly Top 100 St. Louisans to Know to Succeed in Business. It's my honor to welcome Adrian Bracey. Adrian, thanks for joining me. Brian, thank you for having me this morning. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we got connected and I um, was really excited to have you on the show. I think uh, not only your background and your past, but what, even what you're doing today fits perfectly into what I'm trying to um, to get out there. And, and that's the amazing leaders we have here in our community. And you fit right into that fold. So I'm excited to, to share your story and your insight uh, with our listeners. Thank you for having me. I'm honored. Well, thank you. So I always start this podcast off with letting our listeners learn a little bit about you and your organization. So why don't you give a, give us a, a background on yourself as well as what the mission of YWCA is? Sure. Well, a little bit of background on myself. Uh, I think you did a great job with the introduction, so I won't uh, uh, share the readers all of that. But um, what I can say is that Transitioning from the NFL to nonprofit uh, has been exciting as well as challenging, uh, which we can get into a little bit more. So working in the NFL for uh, 15 years uh, was absolutely a wonderful experience. And now I've been here at the uh, helm of the YWCA for 11 years. And um, I'm just excited to be here. The YWCA's mission is eliminating racism and empowering women. And what we do is we help women uh, and provide them with the tools that they need to achieve what we all want in life, which we call at YWCA the three S's, safety, security, and stability. And we also meet each woman where she is with a holistic approach, offering multiple services and getting real results. And so the YWCA, we know that as we Empowered. If one woman is empowered, her family is empowered, as well as the community. And so that's what we do in a nutshell. Uh, we provide sexual assault services, domestic violence therapy. We provide housing for homeless women, uh, early childhood education. Uh, we do have an empowerment program for women who are trying to get a non-traditional degree to uh, increase their, their income, their living wage. We also have a uh, racial justice program. And that program is part of our mission of eliminating racism. Gotcha. So we do a whole lot, uh, but uh, there's a lot to be done. Sure. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this, if, if you don't mind, just uh, because of all the social unrest that we, you know, kind of have in our, in our, you know, I wouldn't say necessarily just here in the community, but across the United States. And I think it's really, um, really neat that you're, you know, that you're part of what I would call the change, right? The um, to bring the change to that. So talk to me about how you and your organization are trying to help resolve some, maybe at some of that social unrest that we have currently here in the St. Louis area. So what we have done uh, for years now, actually 
after uh, the death of Michael Brown in 2013, our then racial justice director, Amy Hunter, uh, introduced a program to the YWCA called Witnessing Whiteness. It's around a book that's uh, authored by Shelley Cutler. And uh, Amy brought it to us, to me, and said, hey, this is something that I really would like to do. And so she started out with a small group uh, of, of allies, uh, and, and you're, you can only be white uh, residents in this program called Legacy Whiteness, because it's an opportunity to be in a safe environment where you get to learn the history of racism uh, and how white people play into that. And so those are things that you don't hear about in school. You're not going to learn it in, in any type of literature in school. So it's, an, it's a safe place um, that, that the group can talk openly. Gotcha. But since then, it went to now a uh, 10-week, it's a 10-week course, uh, and it's done in the fall and in the winter, and it's two hours each week. So we used to have about uh, eight to 10 groups at each, on, at each semester with about 10 to 15 people. But as you can imagine, it has doubled. Now the, the, the man, we have 20 uh, groups going on this semester with about 20 to 25 people in each group. So, wow. yeah, so it's really a demand. It's a great program for um, just really anyone who wants to understand racism. Sure. And then when you get out, uh, there's another uh, program we have called Catalyst Circle, and then that takes it a little bit more into the advocacy. Now, now that we've gone through Witness and Whiteness, now what do we do to, to make change? Uh, and then there's one more program we have uh, within, within the umbrella of our racial justice uh, program. It's called Sister Circle, and that's for women of color who, who just need uh, a place to be to, to go through the healing process of racism and what they go through with racism. Awesome. Well, yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. I think it's um, it's very. I, I was actually talking to a friend later uh, this past week about you know the groups and the organizations that we have in our community here in St. Louis that help you know try to drive some change and um, help heal you know our community. And I think I think everybody can come together as one and say we don't want any unrest in our community. And I, I think it's great to have your organization in our community here in St. Louis to help kind of drive that change and try to help drive some of that social unrest. So I appreciate what you're doing from me to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about leadership. So, you know, you're I, in my my introduction of you. You obviously had quite a career with the NFL, which um, I think is uh, is really exciting. And, you know, I I was a big St. Louis Rams fan until they unfortunately <laughs> left St. Louis and went to L.A. Um, and now what you're doing, obviously, with the YWCA, I think is also important. So talk to me a little about how you got into the leadership roles uh, of the NFL and then how you transitioned to YWCA and the leadership role you have there. What was your path to get there? Well, I've been in leadership for about 35 years. Uh, after college, I went to college in Baltimore, Maryland. And after college, I stayed there for about four years uh, and decided I wanted to move back home to Miami, Florida. My grandmother was getting a little older and I wanted to be there with her. So I decided to leave Baltimore and move back home. Uh, I did, uh, of course, submit resumes while I was looking, and I landed a great job with an aviation company. And I started as an assistant controller. Uh, within a year's time, uh, I made it to the controller's position. So the, the, the president uh, really took to me as far as a leader. And so he limited, he let the uh, controller go. I took over that position. So I was there for five years as the controller. That's really my first real, I would say, true leadership role. Um, and, you know, what, and what was really great about that is I was able to take my education of accounting and apply it. And that is like so awesome because I know so many, so many people, they go and they get a degree in something and they never ever get to use it in sure. their career. So I was really excited that I was able to use my, my education. Uh, and then one day, I decided to join a professional organization called the National Association of Black Accountants. Uh, we call it NABA. And I joined the organization and I became very active. I was actually the director of student affairs. I took it very seriously uh, because I was tutoring kids, uh, young people in college. And so that was very important to me uh, that they were able to do well in accounting. Because accounting can be a little challenging, uh, most people would tell you. 
Sure. Uh, and so I said, you know what, this is something I'm going to put my whole heart into. Well, one day the president of the chapter said, Adrian, I have something to share with you, something confidential. We went to lunch. He said, I just had an, an interview with the Miami Dolphins for a controller's position. And I was so thrilled for him. I, you know, I said, I know you'll get it. He said, well, I use Brian Henderson as my reference. And so I went back to my office about 30 minutes later, I get a call from Brian. He says, Adrian, I just got a call from the Miami Dolphins for a reference for Twyman. And I told him before they hired him, they really should interview you. <laughs> so I know it was so awkward, but you know, I, I got the interview. I got the call. I got the interview and I, and I got the job. Wow. So I now have to call my dear friend and say, listen, I need to talk to you. So yeah. we went out to lunch and he was crushed, as you can imagine. Um, and, you know, we stayed friends for maybe another year or so. But then after that, that was the end of our friendship. Sure. So I, that, that was my entrance uh, into the NFL was because of the networking that I did. And then what I always tell, uh, tell young people is when you volunteer, do your best as if it is a paid job because you never know who's watching you. Because if I had not taken my volunteer role with NABA so seriously, Brian would not have noticed me because I didn't know Brian that well. We weren't right. friends. Um, I, you know, I knew of him and I think, and I'm, I'm almost positive because I did kind of share a little bit with Brian at the time, but he did say it was because of the, uh, the seriousness that I took of my job just as a volunteer. So I always share with people, you know, take it seriously because you never know where to lead you. And, and in networking, of course, as we all know, is, is, is also very good for your career. Absolutely. No, I think that's that's solid advice right there uh, to take whatever you're doing, whether it's a volunteer position, your job or, you know, in something you're doing in the community. Take it seriously and take it as if you were getting paid to do that job, because you, you great point. You never know who's watching. You never know who's seeing your skill sets uh, at hand. Um, and who knows where it can come in the end. So I think it's great, great advice. Yeah, so for me, that's, that's how I entered the NFL, through that volunteer role. Um, and so then I, so I ended up working for the Miami Dolphins. Uh, at the time, it was owned by the Robbie family. The, the building, uh, the stadium was called Joe Robbie Stadium after the owner, Joe Robbie. And unfortunately, uh, they just did not do well with their tax planning and their business uh, model. And they end up selling it to Wayne Heisinger, who at the time owned, um, I believe he owned Blockbuster at the time. He also owned years before Waste Management. So he was a businessman. So he sure. purchased the team, the Miami Dolphins, and the Robbie Stadium. I was then promoted over to the stadium side as the vice president of finance and administration. And the stadium work was fascinating. We had uh, Wayne Heisinger brought in baseball. So now we had baseball in the stadium. Of course, the Dolphins. We had concerts, YouTube concerts. We had soccer tournaments, international tournaments. So it was really a good experience, but I really wanted, Brian, I really wanted to get back into football. So I heard that the LA Rams were moving to St. Louis. And again, I decided to use my networking skills. And I sent my resume to a colleague in the NFL in New York. He then sent my resume to the president of the St. Louis Rams. I interviewed for that job in 1995. And I was hired, and I moved. I left the Rams, uh, the Miami Dolphins, to work for the St. Louis Rams at the time. I was very happy. After 12 years, I decided, you know what, I really wanted something different. I heard about my colleague in Phoenix, Charlie, was retiring as the CFO for the Arizona Cardinals. So once again, uh, using my networking skills, I sent my resume to the president of the Arizona Cardinals. I, I interviewed, and I got the job. Um, and so. Um, that's how I ended up my career through the NFL for 18 years. But I was really getting burnt out, and I really missed St. Louis. I love St. Louis. So a friend came to Phoenix for vacation. We had dinner. I told her my goal was to, to get back to St. Louis, and she said, we'll help you. After she left, I took a course by Stephen Covey called Writing Your Personal Mission Statement. And during that, that, that process, that, that, that uh, process, I learned, that's when I really learned my personal mission statement is inspiring and enhancing the lives of women and girls. About a year later, my girlfriend who came to Phoenix called me and said, the CEO of YWCA, Metro St. Louis, is retiring. Send me your resume. Uh, and 
11 years later, here I am. And here you are. That's, that's my journey. No, I think it's a great journey. I think, you know, the theme there is uh, always work hard and always use your network to the fullest extent. And uh, you never know where it can take you. And, and uh, as anybody who knows me, I'm an avid networker. It's one of my great passions. It's one of the reasons I started this podcast. And so I, I think that's great advice as well. Talk to me about your leadership style. Uh, how do you lead your current organization, YWCA, and what's your style of leadership? My style is a, more of a collaborative leadership style. I believe in having input from my executive team. I think it's important to hear the voice of the people that work with me. Uh, I think for me and my, my experience, it makes people feel valued, appreciated, and when you can, when you can, when you can get that, typically those employees will follow you to the end. They trust you. They believe in you. Um, and so for me, I just enjoy hearing opinions from others, even if I don't use it. And I even say it front sometimes, listen, I may not use your, your advice, but I want to hear it because I may use it. Sure. Uh, but I will never know if, if you don't share that with me. Absolutely. Well, it allows you to empower those employees and feel like those, you know, let those employees feel like they have a say so in the direction of the organization. And to your point, you don't necessarily have to take their opinion, but at least they're, they're, you're collaborating with them um, and, and they feel like they, they're empowered by the role that they have within the organization. Absolutely. That's a very good word, empowered. And, and that's so key. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, what kind of qualities do you think are important in a leader? It can be qualities that, that you have as an, as the leader of the YWCA or even other uh, coworkers or colleagues you have. What qualities do you look for in a leader? Uh, personally, uh, I'm a former, well, I, just, I don't even say former, but I'm a CPA. Uh, I'm not practicing accounting any, any longer, but as a CPA, uh, it was always driven in, into us. Integrity is People must trust you. And so integrity for me is, is one of the top characteristics of, of a good leader for me. Uh, also, self-awareness. Um, I just truly believe that a good leader should know whether or not they are offending people or not, if they're helping people or not. But if you're not self-aware, if, you, if you're not even in the zone of, of that, you won't know. So for me, self-awareness is key. I practice that, um, and, and for me, it has worked. It really has worked. So, uh, and some of the other ones are kind of the basic good communication skills. Uh, we all know that we can have good communication skills. But Brian, I'll tell you the other thing that, unfortunately, I didn't develop until late, but it, it's so critical, which is being decisive. Decisiveness is really needed in good leadership because your people have to know that your word is your word. And, yes. and if I can't make a decision, then it's hard for them to follow me. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think I also, I think also in good leaders it, and it's okay to, um, be the decision maker and make the decisions, even anyone there where they're tough decisions and you have to, as a leader of an organization, obviously there's many times you probably have to make very hard and tough decisions, but being able to make those decisions and be, and have the integrity to make those decisions and do what you think is best for the organization. I think every leader needs to have the, that, that skill set. So that's a great, great piece of advice. Yeah. And of course there are others, confidence and so forth. So, you know, those are the, the good ones. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I, I recorded an episode last week um, and I asked the, the CEO of the company, you know, how does he motivate um, his employees? And, and I'll ask you the same question, especially during this COVID pandemic. You know, I, 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 I lead sales for our organization and, you know, at, at times during the last six months, it's, it's been a challenge to motivate people, uh, especially, you know, a lot of people have been working remotely, working from home. So tell me, how do you motivate the employees that work there at the YWCA um, outside of COVID, but also during this last six months? Well, outside of COVID, uh, one of the things that we try to do at the YWCA is to make employees feel valued and appreciated. Uh, unfortunately, in nonprofits, we don't pay the same sale as a for-profit, so being able to pay an employee what they're worth is not always possible uh, for us because our budget, because of our budget. Sure. So there are other things we can compensate to make them feel worthy, even though it's not paid. Because I've read, oh my gosh, so many times where 
employees don't necessarily leave a job because of pay. They leave because of the way they're treated, because yes. of their, you know. So we try to treat them uh, with respect, um, and especially now during COVID, because what we're finding is a lot of employees are so stressed. Um, some of our our employees, you know, they have family members that have lost jobs, so there's a financial stress. Um, right now, I have several employees who have six family members at home, so we're allowing them to work at home uh, once or twice a week. Uh, just, I know we say little things, but for them, that's a major. Sure. Um, and so we try to do whatever we can to be flexible with the hours that they need to come from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. or whatever. We try to have flexibility. Um, but for me, as a as a leader, what I don't do is I don't micromanage because that is so frustrating. Sure. Uh, you know, you have a lot going on, and now I'm being watched and, and so forth, and so we try not to to do that. So those are just some of the things that we we've, we've done before and during COVID. Yeah, and I think you know I, I hear the micromanage word a lot on this uh, podcast where leaders say they you know they don't micromanage, and you know when you, when I hear you talking there, what I hear is culture, right? You try to create a good company culture to where employees want to come to work every day, know they're not going to be micromanaged, but also know they have the flexibility to be honest with you about what's going on in their life, and I think those little three those little things can mean a lot to to an organization. You know, I deal with nonprofits a lot, and I I, I know that they don't have large budgets. Uh, but it's those little things that make those employees want to come to work there. And I also feel like in the nonprofit industry, it helps if you really are behind the passion and the mission of the nonprofit uh, to help you, you know, be motivated each and every day to come work there. That is so true. And, and our employees really can tell you. Most of I mean, we have employees who've been here for 25 years, and it's because of the mission. They are passionate about the mission of the YWCA. And so you're right on about that. And the last thing I would say about motivating the staff it's just helping them to understand self-care i mean for my for my direct report my executive team just trying to get them not to to put in 12 and 14 hours a day because that burns you out and you really need to to take time we have not been able to close uh our doors so we're not working at home there's no uh, work from home for the executive team we've been in the office uh so that we can allow our staff to have that flex time sure uh, so it's it's been, uh, but self care. I would definitely share with the, with the audience self care. Absolutely. So let me ask you this: Did, You know, you've had a, a great career. Um, did you have a, a mentor or somebody in the early st- starts of your career that kind of mentored you along the way, or, or gave you pieces of advice? And if so, how did you find that mentor for for somebody who maybe you know early in their career, if they're looking to get into a leadership position or an ex- into an executive type role? Um, what advice would you give them if they're trying to find a mentor and, and talk to us about kind of your past and having a mentor or somebody who guided you? My first mentor uh, was my adopted mom. Um, so she was the one who helped build the character, my foundation, uh, and that foundation was in God. So it was a spiritual journey as well. Uh, but from that foundation, my values, my, all of my values just started to develop. And that, that confidence uh, that she instilled in me um, and, and just made me want to do the best. But one thing she told me, Adrian, you cannot save the world. But if you could save one person, if you can just help one person, you're, you're doing well. Because I would always try to, to help everybody. And that's still my nature. But now I hear her, you know, I don't know, 50 years later, hear, just to hear her voice in my mind. I can't do that. I can't save the world. So, uh, so she was my first mentor. And then as I went into the NFL, uh, he was at the time the CFO for the uh, Florida Marlins, uh, Jonathan, uh, who then later became the CFO for Major League Baseball. But he started at the Marlins. Uh, and so we worked in the same building. I was with the stadium. He was at the Marlins. And so he really helped me with the transition when the Miami Dolphins were sold to Wayne Heisinger. He came with Wayne Heisinger, and so he helped me, an African-American man, and, and so he helped me through through that transition. And then the transition from the St. Louis Rams to the Arizona Cardinals, I also had to call on him for advice. So um, he was always there to just give me that motivation, that little nudge that I needed. Adrian, you got this. You can do this. And resources. 
if you know sure. if, if I didn't have resources, he would say, well, this is what you need to look into, and you know. So, uh, so so Jonathan was, I should say, my my career uh, mentor, and my mom was my personal mentor. No, those are great, great, great mentors. I, you know, I, I have, uh, my dad was a mentor to me and, and, uh, now my father-in-law is a mentor to me. And, and then I, I also, I also have, you know, what I would call community leaders or our small business owner leaders here in St. Louis that, you know, I will call on from time to time and ask for advice in uncertain situations. And I think, um, I guess my point of asking that question is I think it's vital for anybody who is expiring to, to get into a leadership type role or be an executive in an organization that there's a journey to get there. And it's, it's very, it's very important to have a mentor or somebody along the way to help guide you in the, in the right direction. I totally agree. We cannot do this alone. We, we weren't born to, to be alone and to do it alone. That's just not what we were born to do. So God wanted us to, to help each other. And, and that's what we need to do. And it's reciprocal. You know, I always tell people in networking positions and, and even in mentorship, how, now, how can I help you? Absolutely. So even today, I actually have a young person who's my mentor. You know, she's in her 30s because I'm not familiar with social enterprise yet, and so I'm her mentor for her career. So it's yes. a reciprocal relationship. She's absolutely. helping me, I'm helping her, and we both grow. Yeah, absolutely. It's just like networking, right? You can't ever go out and network and expecting just to be introduced to a bunch of people and get referrals left and right if you're not willing to sit there and give to them as well. And so I think it's very important to talk about the reciprocal piece of that. Yep. Let me ask you this. Uh, along your career, have there been any books or podcasts that you have either listened to or books that you have read that have inspired your leadership style um, and help, uh, I guess, guide you to where you are today? Well, yes. My very first leadership book, I was probably late 20s, I think, um, maybe early 30s, I believe late 30s, 20s, but it was uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. So that was my first introduction to leadership, and I still have that same book, and I've loaned different people. Uh, it's all marked up now, but <laughs> um, yeah, that was my book, and, and I, I loved it. So that was my, my, my initial uh, experience with it. But since then, here recently, um, I do want to go even further into leadership uh, coaching one day. So I am currently now uh, a John Maxwell certified coach. Yeah. From speaker. So John Maxwell has been my more recent uh, mentor for leadership development. Yeah, John Maxwell's a great coach. They got a great program. I, I've actually taken a class there as well. So um, that's that's really some really good advice. Um, Adrian, I always end this podcast. I ask the exact same question on every show, and the 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 reason I ask it is I you know the point of this show is to give any of our listeners um, some tidbits or pieces of advice that they can take and apply to their day to day life. And so, for the people listening to this podcast, what is one piece of advice you would give them when it comes to leadership? I would say, don't be afraid to act as a leader. Um, sometimes leaders, we feel that we know it all. We don't need the advice of anyone. Um, even uh, if that person could be an expert in a certain area uh, as a leader, don't be afraid to act. And, and for me, that has helped me not only as a leader, but even for those who are uh, aspiring to be a leader, don't be afraid to act. And so that would be my, I have many, many more, but I, I would say that that's one that I would like to share. Is don't be afraid to act. I appreciate that. I think it's very important to, to piece of advice, right? Don't be afraid to ask. And I think in whatever position you're in today, um, don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to ask for advice. I think you'll find that people are always willing to help, um, others. I think that's just in our nature. I think um, as human beings and as um, you know, individuals, I, I think we want to help others. And I said, I, I agree with that. Don't be afraid to ask. So, Adrian Bracey, on behalf of STL Leaders, it's been a true pleasure to have you on the show. I really appreciate you taking the time today to talk to us. Uh, thank you for being here. Brian, thank you for having me. Like I said, it's been an honor and I just wish you all the best. And God thank, bless. Thank you so much. This episode is brought to you by Enterprise Bank and Trust. For more than 30 years, Enterprise Bank and Trust has primarily focused on serving the lifetime financial needs of privately held businesses, their owner families, and other success-minded individuals. 
Thank you for listening to this episode of the STL Leaders Podcast.